Welcome to Wichita Liberty TV with Bob Weeks. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news analysis and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public policy. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Bernstein. Andrew Bernstein holds a PhD in philosophy from the Graduate School of the City at University of New York. He has taught at Hunter College, the New School for Social Research, and Pace University. Dr. Bernstein has lectured at universities across the United States, including Harvard, Yale, Stanford, the United States Military Academy at West Point, and at philosophical conferences both in America and abroad. In 2013 and 14, he was the Hayek Research Fellow at the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism at Clemson University, where he taught and principally researched and wrote the first draft of his forthcoming book, Heroes and Hero Warship, an Examination of the Nature and Importance of Heroism. Dr. Bernstein was in Wichita for several speaking engagements, and he stopped by the Wichita Liberty TV studios. Let's watch my conversation with Dr. Andrew Bernstein. Andrew Bernstein, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. It's good to be here, Bob. Thank you. You've written a book called The Capitalist Manifesto, The Historic, Economic, and Philosophic Case for Laissez-Faire. So laissez-faire, that's kind of a fancy word, a French word even. Right. Could you explain what exactly that means in relation to philosophy and economics and politics? Right. I mean, it, it takes us, it is a French word, it takes us to the to the essence of the capitalist system, which is the principle of individual rights. It means government hands off your life. You know, as long as you're not a criminal, as, you're, as long as you don't initiate force or fraud against some innocent victim, the government has no business telling you what to do. The government's proper function is to protect individual rights, not to violate individual rights. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's what let's say fair really, really means. And I think that you mentioned there one of the key principles is as long as you do not initiate force or fraud. And I think that um, is something that libertarians like myself believe they call it sometimes the non-aggression axiom. Is that pretty much the same thing? Yes. And I and I think, you know, people go, going back at least as far as John Locke, you'll recognize this, the founding fathers of, of the American Republic recognized it. I think Ayn Rand explained it, you know, at, at, a, at a level, a philosophic level deeper than than anybody else, but yes, the, you know, I, and I think Rand really emphasizes very nicely that the the initiation of force must be banned from human life. If we're if we're to have a civilized society, mm -hmm. you know, the initiation of force must be banned, not just by private criminals, but above all by the government, because the government is is the worst danger to my freedom and life or yours or, or anybody's. Because a private criminal, Al Capone or, or whomever, you know, has to has to fight against the criminal justice system, but the but dictator. He is the criminal justice system. He is the government. He's got the power of the state behind him. So he can, he can murder millions, and, the, and dictators do. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing about libertarians. I think most people would agree that we should not hurt other people, but libertarians assist on implying that ethic or philosophy to the government as well. Right, absolutely. The government is, is, is a government gone bad is, is the main danger. You know, I remember, Bob, I'm old enough, you know, I'm a Cold War kid. You know, I remember in, in, in the 60s, there were these defenders of the Soviet Union, you know, and they used to they used to say, in the Soviet Union, there's no crime in the streets, and I used to say, that's because all the criminals are in the government, mm -hmm. you know, and the, you <laughs> yes. know, Stalin or Khrushchev, or whoever it is, can use the the full police power of the state to to butcher millions of people, and of course, the National Socialists or Nazis and Communists and various dictators, that's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, capitalism um, is a relatively recent invention of mankind, isn't it? I mean, yes. maybe a couple hundred years, yes. but in the scale of human existence, that's still uh, fairly new. So um, sometimes capitalism has a bad connotation. I don't think that our president's really a fan of capitalism. What makes capitalism so great? Yeah, you're, you're right, Bob. It's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's a late 18th century British development. It's an Enlightenment era development. Adam Smith around that right, time. Right, Adam Smith and, and, uh, you know, and, the, and the rise of the Industrial Revolution, James Watt, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, these great minds of the Scottish Enlightenment, the British Industrial Revolution. This, this is what capitalism comes in to existence, late 18th, early 19th century. The, the essence of it is individual rights. The proper name is liberalism. Mm -hmm. You know the, the the supporters of liberty. That that was the name that that it went by back then. Uh, it's 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 the name. It still goes by in some European uh, countries. Uh, it's it's the proper name. The supporters of liberty. The supporters of individual rights. 
uh, you know, these statists like Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or, you know, people like that have no logical or moral claim to the term uh, liberalism. We, 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 we deserve that name. And capitalism, the name capitalism is a Marxist name. I mean, M Marx either coined that term or he inherited it from a, a prior socialist and popularized it. But it means the men of capital, the men of wealth, the men who, the men who own the means of production, you know, have enormous economic power to dominate and subjugate the, the poor workers in the in the economic trans uh, in economic transactions, so the very name is, is 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 has packed into it a Marxist conception of the class struggle, and it's very wrong. Yeah, you know, and I get that. I I have a quote from that someone left on our newspaper website. He was speaking about libertarian and capitalism, and it says, "Yeah, that stands for liberty, all right. Liberty to walk over others, especially when one has the money to do so." Um, what's wrong? Is there a fallacy in that line of thinking? Yeah, yes, yes, and hell yes. Okay. There's, there's, there's a fallacy in that line of thinking. The, the essence of, of capitalism, properly understood and properly implemented, is the protection of individual rights. So you have a written constitution with a bill of rights that guarantees to individuals you know, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of intellectual expression, you know, the right to, to earn and own property, your own home, your own land, your own, uh, your own farm, you know, you know, whatever it is, the, 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 the purpose of the government is, is to protect that right. Uh, neither, neither a private individual, no matter how much money he has, nor the government that has the legal right to step all over people, capitalism properly understood is the only system that prohibits that. So, for example, you know, there, there are some people who are not afraid, leftists, you know, socialists, they're not af afraid of the government, they're afraid of private corporations. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I always say to them, what's Bill Gates going to do to me in a, you know, in a, in a, in a free society? Mm -hmm. or, or Warren Buffett, or, you mm -hmm. know, or Sam Walton when, when he was like, these guys are worth tens of billions of dollars. What, what's Microsoft going to do to me, Bob? They're going to make software I don't want to buy? <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they can't force me to buy their, their product. But the government, the government has a legal monopoly on the initiation of force. The government is a potential danger to me, not, not, not private companies or individuals. And I think a lot of people may not realize that Bill Gates became, was he the wealthiest man in the world at one time or whatever? He yes, became that years. way because he uh, developed software in a company and a whole ecosystem that people wanted to buy, not was forced upon them. I think, and I think I think I've just repeated what you said. Oh, you're absolutely right, though. That's true. It's an important point. And even Warren Buffett, I think, uh, with uh, Coca-Cola and some of his investments has done the same type of thing. Now, we have this sales tax issue coming up in Wichita pretty soon that people are going to be voting on. We've talked a lot about that on Wichita Liberty TV. A big chunk of the sales tax is going to go towards an economic development program, specifically a jobs program. So right now I see we're up against a commercial break, but when we come back, I'd like to talk about is capitalism the same as business? Can we grow the Wichita economy by having government planning and government direction of that economy? So we'll take a moment off and be back on Wichita Liberty TV in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, and with me this week is Andrew Bernstein. So capitalism and business, I think a lot of people think those are the same things. And we have our local chamber of commerce saying we've got to make Wichita more business mm -hmm. friendly. So is capitalism and business the same thing? Is there, again, fallacies in that line of argument? No, again, that, that's, that's, that's fallacious thinking. Again, you, I, you, I, I don't think we could... We, the supporters of liberty, I don't think we could stress it enough, Bob. We are, we are the supporters of individual rights across the board in every area of human life regarding personal morality and in, and in economics. So, for example, if some government thinking it's business friendly, you know, wants to use eminent domain to take away my home, your home, or somebody's home to build, you know, a Walmart or build, you know, you know, some business because it, 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 it increases commerce in the city and increases tax revenue. That's a, an egregious violation of individual rights. You're going to force somebody to sell their home. Never mind the fact you're going to give them your know, market value. Even so, you're going to force him to sell his home when he doesn't want to sell his home. So uh, capitalism is, is not necessarily the same thing as, you know, as a government's mentality of being, of being quote, business friendly. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is the protection of individual rights across the board. And speaking of eminent domain, I know there has been some famous cases I'm thinking of uh, in New London, Connecticut, Suzette Kilo, where they took her home. Uh, they were going to build a big um, office or research park, and I believe that land is being used as a trash dump today. The, the government 
government plans never materialize. I, I didn't even know that, but that, that sounds right. It reminds me, you know, government planning. What did Milton Friedman once say? That if, if we put the government in charge of the Sahara, in five years there'd be a shortage of sand? <laughs> shortage you know? of sand, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a brilliant point. The, the government is, is an agency of force. At its best... The government, a government is protective. It protect, uses the force to protect innocent people against those who would initiate it. You know, mm -hmm. it defends us against criminals, mm -hmm. defends us against possible foreign, you know, foreign assault. The, the government, that's the government at its best. That's its proper function. It's not a creative, productive agency. Expecting it to run the economy, you know, efficiently is like is like expecting a, a kitten to be a lion. It's not what it is. It's not it's like, or expecting a cat to fly. It's not in its nature. It's not what it does. You talked about uh, government uh, taking land through eminent domain. That's something that's pretty uh, dramatic, and I think a lot of people have trouble with that. But every day we see government taking your money through taxes right. to give to businesses. Uh, we would pejoratively call it corporate welfare, although I think that's really quite accurate. Either giving grants of money to companies, or what I think is more surreptitious is allowing them to not pay the same taxes that other businesses and people have to pay. That's a violation of the principles of capitalism, too, isn't it? Well, you know, I think funding the government by means of taxation is, is, is theft. Mm -hmm. It's a violation of, of individual rights. And I think f f several points here. One, I think government spending ne needs to be drastically cut. The government shouldn't be involved in, in, in welfare. You know, it shouldn't be involved in, in regulation of businesses. The, the overwhelming, the, the, what the, the, the government should properly do is you know, have a criminal justice system to protect honest people from criminals, have a civil court system to arbitrate legitimate disputes between and amongst honest persons, and have a volunteer military to defend the country against, you know, uh, bad guys internationally. Uh, the, the rest of what the government does should be should be done by private individuals and private enterprise. So government funding, uh, government uh, spending could be should be drastically cut. Taxation is is a violation of, of of individual rights. That's not the way the government should raise money the, 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 for the for the proper functions of what government's supposed to do to uh, protect individual rights. That that money should be raised voluntarily by by various various means. When we talk about government planning, um, you know, my viewers know that I testify quite often in front of the city council um, and other governmental agencies questioning the ability of government experts to plan our economy. And they say to me, Bob, so you don't like our plan. What is your plan? And when I say, well, my plan is uh, capitalism, or like Adam Smith said, I think the simple system of natural liberty or something, they say, well, you don't have a plan. It's not going to work. So, how can I defend myself against that charge? Yeah, that is that is a, a, a canard that's often been you know leveled against capitalism and and gr various great economists like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, you know, in the Austrian school, have answered that you know that that planning actually takes place only under capitalism. It it, it can't take place under under statism or under socialism, and you know and, and the reason for that, or, well well several reasons, but one one salient point here is that under capitalism. Millions, everybody in, in the society, in, in, in thinking about uh, any ec economic part of their life, what, their, what job they want, how, how they, are they going to start a business, how are they going to run their business, where are they, where are they, where are they going to live, are they, are they going to buy a home here or you know, what there, is engaged in, in economic planning. What capitalism does is it unleashes the brain power of millions and millions and millions of people in society to, to plan for themselves. You have a tremendously great amount of brain power. Then, then the government, who has a few... You know, politicians, a few bureaucrats trying to plan out, you know, for, for thousands of people or, or millions of people. You, you have much greater brain power planning under capitalism than under socialism mm -hmm. and the quality of the brain power. You know, in a real statist regime, you know, who heads it? Stalin, Mao, you know, Hitler under national socialism. Mm -hmm. These guys aren't, aren't, aren't producers. They're murderers. <laughs> you know, yeah. under, under capitalism, you unleash the great minds. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Steve Jobs, George Washington Carver in the field of agricultural science. You know, you unleash, you unleash these geniuses, the, their, their mind power then creates wealth. This is the, the planning goes on every day under under capitalism. It's rational. It's it's peaceful. It's non it's non initiation it's not force. Not the government. Yeah, the, the government's initiating force against us. That's not rational planning. So here's another quote I grabbed from a fellow who was commenting at our newspaper. He says, "You know, this is not the 1700s where little or no government exists and things are simple. This is the modern world and things are a lot more complicated." And I think therefore he's saying we have to have government plan this economy for us. It's just too complicated to leave it to. 
people. Well, it is more complicated. That's the exact reason why we need individual rights and, and, and private planning, not government planning. The, the government can't possibly know what 300 million people desire. It's, or even 300,000 or yeah. 400,000 in Wichita. Right. There's an impossible... Uh, there's an impossible problem there. You, you can't know that you can't retain that much information. But you know, and and, and it comes back to, to the errors of paternalism. You know that, that the the you know best what's what's right for you. I know best what's right for me. The government can't possibly know as well as I do, as well as any individual knows what what's what's best for us. And so our, our lives are going to be much better if, if directed by our own minds than if directed by government quote planners. And I think some famous economists that I'm sure you're familiar with, like Frederick Hayek, has even a book or a paper called The Fatal Conceit yes. about how very, like you said, there's so much to know and it's so complicated that government officials simply can not know everything they need to know to plan, but they're still going to go ahead and do it anyway. Right. You could, tur you could turn that around on the on the person who wrote that letter. The, mo the, the very fact that it's more complicated is all the more reason why the government can't do it. They can't have that knowledge, but we, we can have for ourselves. You know, and I spoke last night at, at the Bastiat Society, mm -hmm. and, you know, Frederick Bastiat pointed out, you know, brilliantly that on, under uh, individual rights and, and free trade, how do you put Paris gets fed? Mm -hmm. You know, the, that private individuals planning out their own business how, how much how, how much corn can I grow how much wheat can I grow what's the demand in Paris for you know for, 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 for this type of food you know and you, you have thousands and thousands of, of producers you know bu buyers and sellers planning for themselves and and and, and, and that that combination you know of, of minds in action means that un, un, under under capitalism you get this tremendous cornucopia of, of wealth being produced and the consumer demand is satisfied under socialism, it's not possible. The government can't possibly know what, what the consumers want. And I think when we come back from this commercial break, I might talk about the invisible hand of Adam yes. Smith, about how all this economic activity is coordinated without some governmental board or commission overseeing what we're going to do. So we'll take another moment off. I'm Bob Weeks with Andrew Bernstein. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, and with me this week, my guest, Andrew Bernstein. So before the last break, we were talking about the impossibility of government planning in a complex society. I think Richard Epstein has a book called Simple Rules for a Complex Society or something like that. What are the rules that we need to follow, and how does an economy coordinate itself under capitalism when we don't have overbearing uh, government boards and commissions planning for us? Well, I think it is. I think, I think Epstein is right. I think it is simple. The, the, the one rule that has to be followed, a moral principle, actually, is... Is, is, is you, you do not initiate force against innocent victims. Mm -hmm. you, you do not initiate force or fraud. And um, regarding regarding the economy, I mean, the way that plays out in, in, a, in a free market with individuals engaging in voluntary trade, you know, vo voluntary transactions to, to mutual benefit, the price system tells producers, uh, the price system on a free market tells, tells producers what's, what's in demand how 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 much in demand? Mm -hmm. What what what's going to be profitable? You know, for the, for them to produce under, under socialism, there is no price system. The government decides. You know, there's two million people in the country, so so we need you know two million pairs of shoes. You know, or, or whatever it is. Uh, there, there's no price system. You know, they manufacture what they think, mm -hmm. what they, or, they, what, or what they claim, or what they dictate individuals should want. And at best, they, they manufacture that and, and, and dispense it to, to the public without any regard for you know, what, what individual citizens want. What the price system gives that information to private producers, what individuals want, how much they, how much they want it. And oftentimes, I think when government gets involved in the economy, trying to provide things or direct the economy, one of the first things they do is to override the price system and uh, so that we don't have the benefit of that type of thing. I want to switch gears for just a moment. You're um, associated with the philosophy of Ayn Rand, objectivism. Yes. And we have uh, business leaders all the time in Wichita, Kansas, and I'm sure across the country. They come to the city council and say, you know what, this project I'm doing, this shopping center, apartment building, hotel, or whatever, I'm not doing this for me. 
I'm doing it for the community so that people can have jobs and you can have more tax revenue. That's why you should grant me a tax abatement or a subsidy. What do you think Ayn Rand and you personally would say about that line of thinking? Well, Ayn Rand might have said nothing that's repeatable. I mean, I, I think okay. she, she had a temper. I think that would have that would have angered her. But I think the uh, um, the, the the moral point here is we're so we, we become so imbued with 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 an altruist ethics, mm-hmm. you know, o- over the last two thousand years or more. You know, the idea that al- altruism is not is not the, is not the belief that we should be kind to others. Altruism is the belief that we must sacrifice ourselves for others. We should, our, our our wants and needs and desires are less important than yours. Absolutely, for example. A- a- absolutely, we the altruism preaches that we should sacrifice ourselves for others. You now, this cause ourselves pain, cause ourselves misery or suffering, you know, in order in order to benefit others. So somebody like that, the, the businessman you're talking about, say, see, I'm a good altruist. I'm going to sacrifice myself for society. And, and Ayn Rand was the one, I think, more than anybody who realized capitalism requires an ethics, a moral code of rational egoism, that it, it is my right and your right and any living being's right to, to pursue our own happiness, to pursue our own values, you know, to do it you know, honestly and productively, not by initiating force or fraud, but by, 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 by creating wealth, and that that, that is morally right, that, that, that to pursue my own happiness is morally right. And so businessmen should proudly say, this, uh, th- this business that I, that I run, I'm running it for profit. I want to make a lot of money. I'm, I want. I, I, I'm concerned with my own happiness. It's absolutely morally it's my moral right to do this. And as a felicitous secondary consequence, there's going to be enormously positive consequences for the community. There's going to be jobs. There's going to be going to be wealth created. But I am in business to make money and to do that, to do that for, for myself. That's. That's, that's everybody's moral right. And under a capitalist system where we have a government that protects our rights and liberties, then the businessman cannot force you to trade with him. He can only incite or induce you by providing something that you want at a price you're willing to pay. The two parties trade together. And it's like John Stossel says, you buy a gallon of milk at the store and it's this weird double thank you moment where both parties say thank you because both are pleased that this happened. So... Um, Right. That, that's uh, something there. Um, the um, um, when government, one idea I want to explore too is that capitalism. We we've been kind of talking like it's a great system for success, but it's also a system that allows for and actually maybe even demands failure. So. What do we do about the people who say capitalism is cruel, it's survival of the fittest, and the losers are bankrupt and they don't have any future? Is there anything wrong with that line of argument? Well, that's also that's also a, a canard that's been you know, a, a long time, time falsehood that's that's been, that's been believed by, by many people. I mean, the the vast creation of wealth that occurs under you know under in, under the system of, of individual rights means that if some if somebody's struggling, uh, you know, Walmart let's say puts uh, some local retailer out of, out of business. Mm-hmm. Although that's greatly exaggerated. I've, I've been in any number of towns, big towns, small towns, where there's a Walmart, and then all up and down the town, there's all kinds of small retail stores. But let's say some retailer goes out of business you know, because of Walmart. Even aside from the fact that you know, the, the, the Walmart creates jobs and, and the, the, the former owners might possibly work at Walmart, if they're struggling, the enormous wealth creation uh, of the capitalist system makes possible an enormous amount of private charity that, that no, no, nobody's going to starve uh, under capitalism. Furthermore, I think the system of individual rights um, in, encourages, uh, and, and the egoism that individual rights is based on, encourages charity because under altruism, where you, where you're, it's your duty to help others. If if it's your duty, if it's your duty to sacrifice yourself for others, you know, if you have to sacrifice yourself for others. That's a slave, Bob. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to you you have to do this this for others. You have to do this work for others. That's slavery. Nobody who's enslaved feels kindness or benevolence or goodwill towards their masters that they have to sacrifice for. Mm-hmm. But under the system of individual rights and egoism, you have the right to your own life and you have the right to pursue your own you know your your, your own happiness. The, the threat of others is removed. They're not a threat to you. And then you are free to have benevolent you know goodwill 
towards your brothers and sisters. And I think you, there's one of the re two reasons why you see so much charity under capitalism that you don't see anywhere else. The economic reason, obviously, people have much more wealth with which to contribute. But the moral reason gets overlooked. There's no duty to help others. That 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 threat of other people is is removed, and now you're free to have benevolent, you know, positive relationships with your brothers and sisters. So Ayn Rand was not opposed to charity and volunteerism because I think some people might think right, that she was opposed to that, but she just says voluntary instead of forced, right? Right. The, the key, the, the key moral difference here that underlies the political difference, the the, the difference between choice and being forced, the the the, the difference between doing it voluntarily or or, or or having to do it, doing it because it's a value to you because you care about your fellow man, you care about your brothers and sisters, not because anybody, your family or, or your church or, or your government is, is, is telling you that it's a, it's an unchosen moral obligation. Mm -hmm. There's all the difference in the world between between helping others as, as a value or helping others as, as as a duty. There's all the difference in the world. I can give you a good example. I always tell my students, um, is the, 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 the advocates of charity themselves are often very confused on that. They might tell you, go into the nursing home and work with the elderly. It's your moral obligation to do so. Mm -hmm. And then 30 seconds later, the same person might tell you, you'll help the elderly in the nursing home. You'll form relationships with people who have had extraordinary lives, and you'll, these relationships will enrich your lives. Now, the second one is, is egoistic, and that's mm -hmm. Ayn Rand's uh, the thinking. Interaction with, with other people, positive interactions, will enormously enrich your life. It's, 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 a, it's a tremendous value. It's not a duty. It's not something you have to do. It's something that you choose to do. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, I believe we're out of time on that note. So, Andrew Bernstein, thank you very yeah. much for appearing on Wichita Liberty TV. Thanks for having me, Bob. I'm Bob Weeks. We'll see you at this time next week.